Hey you guys, we have some Indian food today. I made this butter chicken. That's right, Wad. Wad, I can cook. The palak paneer and the garlic naan and the basmati rice, I did not make. I got that from Himalayan doko. I did make my own rice with the butter chicken, but the rice from an actual Indian restaurant is a lot better than mine. Palak paneer is like squares of cheese in creamed spinach. It's so good. This needs to be heated up a little bit more. Yeah, oh my God, it's so cold. Welcome to the last recap of the Quiet On Set series. Oh, I think I just need to like mix it up. Okay, where did we leave off? So Brian Peck is being sentenced October 2004. Drake goes to the courthouse and mind you it was a lot easier to go to the courthouse back in the day without paparazzi crowding you um so his identity was still pretty sealed Drake walks into the courthouse and he sees Brian's entire side of the courthouse filled with supporters for him Meanwhile, Drake's side is him, his mom, his brother, and that's it. I also think I forgot to mention when Brian Peck was arrested, Drake told his dad and his dad, the first thing he said was, I'm so glad that he wasn't able to do anything to you. So Drake felt too bad to come clean to his dad. So he didn't tell his dad that he was the one that got him arrested. So in the courthouse, it's just his mom, his brother and Drake. So Brian pled no contest to two of the charges. I'm not sure what no contest means. I learned this all in college, of course I forget. But he was sentenced to 16 months in prison. And during sentencing, the judge accepts letters of support from people to try to sway the sentencing. The documentary took the liberty of finding out the names of all of the letters of support that came in for Brian, and you will be shocked at some of them. James Marston wrote a letter in support for Brian. It's even weirder because James Marston says that he's known Brian for like 14 years or something. Meaning he must have met Brian when he himself was a kid. Other actors from Boy Meets World wrote a letter of support. Dan Schneider did not, but two directors from The Amanda Show, The Corrells, uh, wrote a letter in support. The letters were so victim blamey. Most of them were like, I'm sure Brian was like enticed by Drake or like he must have been coerced into doing this. Babe, what 15 year old boy wants this to happen to him? Disgusting. A few people actually ended up coming forward saying they weren't given all the information. And if given the chance, they would not defend him today. Too little too late, babe. The damage has been done. What's even worse is that once he was released, he worked with the Corrells on a Disney Channel show, The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. He worked as a voice actor for one of the episodes. And in the Corrells letter, they even said, we would love to work with Brian Peck again. Um, there they were giving him his first job out of prison. Disgusting, okay? Nothing they say now will make it okay. And in 2005, yet another Nickelodeon worker was arrested for child molestation. What? So, after yet another person, Nickelodeon kind of ramped up its background checks on people. Again, too little too late. Because this other guy that was arrested was already a registered sex offender at the time he got this job at Nickelodeon. 
So during this time, this was kind of like the golden era of Nickelodeon when iCarly was coming out, Victorious was out, Sam and Cat, Drake and Josh was in its prime and Dan was becoming even more powerful than he already was, which showed in a lot of the ways he would treat his cast members. He would call them stupid idiots, just not things that you should be doing in the workplace. This is also when the digital age started to come about. So Dan was really into it. He would always take videos of the cast members and watching these videos over, it's very odd. There was this one video where he came up behind Jeanette McCurdy and scared her, but it wasn't like the kind of funny scaring that people do to their friends. It was like, Aah! and she was screaming in bloody murder, like terrified for her life. And if she didn't like it, she couldn't just be like, hey, I don't like that, do it again, because he was so powerful and in control of her career. So they were all just kind of like, okay with him doing weird things and recording them. Like there was this one video of him tickling Miranda Cosgrove on camera and I'm like, ew, what? No boss should be doing that at all. That is sick. I'm like almost done with this. Also during the time where these shows were happening, Dan was kind of just pushing the boundaries of sexualizing young girls in his shows. He always was showing their feet, making them do really weird things like shaking weights and it just looked sexual. He would just have them do things that looked overtly sexual that children should not be doing. Even the cameraman remembers the props just being very bizarre. Like there was this one scene in Zoe 101 where Zoe and Alexa Nichols, another actor in Zoe 101, they were like trying to get this candy open and it was this like goo candy. They like made it so it squirted at Jamie Lynn's face when they opened it. But like in reality, they were just behind the camera with like a syringe squirting goo at her face. And Alexa Nichols recalls one of the adults on set being like, that's a cum shot. Meanwhile, she had no idea what that meant. She was 12 years old. It's just sick. Dan Schneider could not stop laughing. This man should not be on children's shows. Absolutely not. There was a costumer in the documentary that remembers Dan always having her massage him on set. Not even just her, a lot of the other women on set were required to give him massages. So in 2014, they have the Kids' Choice Awards where Dan wins a Lifetime Achievement Award and it's basically all of his cast members praising him except for Jeanette McCurdy, who was not a fan of Dan at all. Jeanette McCurdy actually wrote a book recently about her experiences as a child actor. And she talks a lot about how Dan was not a good boss and how he was kind of like verbally abusive on set. Jeanette McCurdy's mom dies and she goes back to work like not even a week later. Nickelodeon got kind of weirded out by that, so they launched an investigation into Dan Schneider. And as a result, he was no longer allowed to interact with the cast members again. Of course, Dan like denies this. He's like, I actually just chose to give notes for my office. Like, obviously that's not true, babe. Nickelodeon didn't want to get rid of him because he was bringing in all this money. He was so good for the network. Three years after the investigation, Dan is back on set working on two new TV shows, Henry Danger and Game Shakers. I've never seen either of those two. I honestly stopped watching after iCarly. Like I never watched Victorious, which was huge. And I never watched Sam and Cat. But some of the scenes I saw from Victorious were crazy. Like they would have these extras online that Dan would create. And it would be like Ariana Grande behind the scenes doing really inappropriate things like, oh, like squeezing a potato saying like the juice needs to come out, like doing inappropriate things with water bottles, like just weird things that 
should not have been going on and the network didn't really know how to deal with it. But now he's back on set, working on two new TV shows. And amidst all this, the Me Too movement comes to life. Basically empowered women to tell their stories about times they've been sexually harassed in the workplace. This made a lot of the women working on Dan's TV shows come forward because they didn't want to keep massaging him. People felt validated that they could come forward, say that Dan Schneider was sexually harassing me in the workplace. And after all this, Nickelodeon did determine that it was harassment in the workplace and they fired Dan Schneider as a result of it. Good riddance. But Nickelodeon gave him $7 million upon his departure. It's a lot of money. He should be getting jail time. <laughs> jail time. Also, can we just discuss, Brian Peck is like out in the world. If I see that motherfucker, it's on sight. It's on sight. How is this man still out here. Dan came out and said that had he had this opportunity again, he would do things a lot differently being a boss. Too little, too late. The damage has been done. Your actions already had a tumultuous effect on these child actors. Amanda Bynes, look what happened to her. She was on top of the world in her prime. And then her transitioning to adulthood just went south for her. She got into substance abuse. Same thing with Drake Bell after Drake and Josh. He got a lot of movie deals, but he turned to substance abuse. It's like this constant cycle we see with child actors or children in the limelight. There's just not enough protections in place to protect them from this. From trauma that they may have to deal with later on. Drake actually got arrested for a few DUIs and he also pled guilty to inappropriate texts he sent to a minor. He got two years probation and 200 hours of community service for it. And then after that, he was like, I need to get some help. So he went to rehab and got a lot better. The documentary kind of ends with the child actors who told their experiences saying that, you know, there needs to be more mental health checks on child actors. They need to be more protected than they were. They need mental health professionals on set. They always need to be watching the kids with these people. We just can't let anything like this happen again. And one of the cast members actually says like, we reward these industries and nobody actually realizes all the things that go on behind the scenes. I had no idea, especially as a kid. And it's because of these cast members coming forward now that we're starting to shed light on it. And that's why I decided to shed light on it because if you guys don't have HBO, you know, um, I gave you a little recap. I just wanted to bring more attention to this because again, Brian Peck is still out there. And there are a lot of child actors out there still. So there's just so much in the industry you need to be careful for. If any of you have kids and they want to go into acting, for after watching this, I would advise them to find another avenue of interest because personally, I don't think there should be child actors. I don't. And I had an amazing childhood because there were, but... No, there shouldn't be child actors. And like, you can put all the protections in place for them, but I feel like things always manage to slip through the cracks. But that being said, there should be more protections. I also forgot, I got gajar kahawa. It's kind of like carrot pudding. I'm honestly so full, but I'll take a little bite. Normally you're supposed to heat this up, but we're gonna eat it cold. <laughs> Cause I'm only having a, like a bite. It's good cold or warm. So yeah, that is the end of the series. Again, they have a fifth episode, but I feel like I said all there is to be said. Um, okay, I'm not gonna lie. I haven't even seen the fifth episode. It's just, it's, it's a hard thing to watch, you know? But I started it. It's just like the cast members give, uh, having interviews. Oh, and Dan actually did an interview after Quiet On Set was released with um, one of his old cast members from Victorious, I think, iCarly. Basically just like denying all, all the things that were said about him. He did admit to like 
not being a good boss, but I just wasn't buying any of the things he was trying to sell. I was like, don't try to save your ass now. And he also said in 2001 that he wanted to get back into children's television. Ha! Ha! Like hell, babe! Nobody better hire him. And with that, I love you guys. Thank you for watching this. Mwah. Bye.